Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church for this, our Sunday morning service. So glad to have each and every one of you here. Spring has shown up, and at least here it's spring. There's other parts of the country. They haven't figured out they're out of winter yet, but uh, praise the Lord. Uh, Brother Gene was with us a little over a week ago. Uh, he made it to Rapid City, South Dakota. Picture of Mount Rushmore right in front of a picture of Mount Rushmore. What a wonderful thing. This is Palm Sunday. We are only one week away from Resurrection Sunday now. And this is such an exciting and yet a very, very serious time of year as well. And I'm so glad that you're here with us. At this time, Brother Jim Grew is going to lead in a song, so feel free to stand at this time. Brother Jim. All right, 490 as we sing our monthly theme song, Revive Us Again, 490. All standing if you can. prayer for our church, our prayer for America. As I was saying, there has never been, uh, there has never been a spiritual revival on the west coast of the United States of America. So let this be the year. Let this be the time. And you know, there's been a lot of bad stuff that spread from east to west lately. Let's have something good spread from west to east. And so we need to pray to the Lord. But you know, here's the interesting thing about revival. We have to turn our hearts so we're revivable. That's very important. And so how, what an important prayer. And the thing is, it can't be done by us alone. It's got to be the power of God. And so we pray for his power. Glad that you're here today. Uh, Christine Aiken. Christine, glad to have you here. And with your grandson, Robert. And, uh, and, uh, uh, pray for Robert. He's going to be flying to Corpus Christi here on Tuesday. He's going to be there for a while. I want you to remember him in your prayers. Jonathan, good to see you back there. I know you've been working because I heard rumors that you're working really, really hard. And so anything that deals with shovels or concrete or anything like that, I mean, I, I hear about it, it just wears me out. So I'm glad you have energy and grateful for that. And uh, then uh, looking here, Rosie, good to see you again. Good to have each and every one of you here. Um, right here, you know, we have our Vermont crew there. We're going to let the air out of their tires. Uh, they're going to try to fly on Tuesday, so the time, to, the time for vandalism is Monday evening. So just uh, letting you know that. Glad to have you folks here. We're going to begin with a word of prayer. Let's ask for the Lord's help in the service. Oh, I, Robin. Hi, Robin. Good to see you. Okay, if you're Robin, does that make Grandpa Batman? He's just smiling. He won't say he is, so okay. 
just checking. Let's have a word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this good day in you and this very, very important day. Lord, as, as scripturally on the scriptural timeline, we consider this Palm Sunday. And Lord, uh, memories of, of history, what took place in, in your plan, the fulfillment of your plan to save mankind. And so, Lord, please help us to look seriously, be introspective, have perspective on knowing everything that you have done for us. Uh, people can say they love, but your love is greater. Help us to know that love today. In Jesus' name, amen. And don't be seated because Brother Jim's going to lead another song here. Okay, number 50 is our greeting hymn, There's Power in the Blood. Sing the first verse and then we'll greet one another. Number 50. Would you be
Brother Jim. And at this time, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for this purple colored thing because it's the first Sunday in April, which means we have a new bulletin of the month. If you need one, raise your hand. And the ushers are roving. They are, they are roving and they are handing out and just looking here, making sure that you're taken care of. And it looks like we have done pretty good at this point. And uh, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and do this. Let us look. It is a busy month, just letting you know that. And so let's start. And you may go, Pastor, or did we have a few people out of town? Yeah, we do. There's a wedding yesterday, and that wedding was in Portland. And so we had a little mini stampede so they could see some people get married. And so some of them this afternoon, they'll be traveling back home. No, I know one family, and they're really suffering for Jesus on a Caribbean cruise. And true story, you know, really suffering now. And uh, anyway, but uh, people are uh, people are moving around, and they're in their route in route back. And so we're uh, grateful for that. Uh, certainly, and we'll pray for this at the offering, guys. Uh, pray for Danelle. Danelle, very sick, double pneumonia, and so please uh, remember her in prayer, and uh, remember that. And uh, just looking today, we will be observing the Lord's table at the end of morning service, uh, just letting you know that. And uh, it's ap apropos because it is Palm Sunday. Now, I'm, my, uh, my pulpit's packed here, so I've got to unload some things here. And that is these came in, uh, these came in on uh, Friday or Saturday. And this is the April devotional, uh, Dwell Magazine. It's a 30-day devotional. And I have spares here. If anybody uh, would like to have one of those, just raise your hand. And uh, Brother Carl, if you would come up and kind of hand these out. Um, usually the Baptist bread, we have a lot of those. But these, we have limited supplies. So raise your hand. Brother Carl will get those passed out, uh, letting you know about that. And then I only have two of these left. And this is an amazing, amazing missions book. There's one in the foyer table. I have one here, and this is written by um, uh, one of our pastors in Vancouver, Washington. He planted a church in Vancouver, brand new church, uh, Bridgeway Baptist Church. It's now been going maybe two or three years, but he wrote a book on his ministry, 25 years a missionary to Russia, an amazing, amazing book. Uh, the books run $20 each, and if you want to get one, you just grab one and then just put book purchase on the envelope. Uh, one of the types of them is just book, book purchase. It'll get to the right department. But I have just two of these left. And so they're going fast. And so just want to let you know about this. And uh, Brother Jim, I'll have you take this to the foyer um, when we're done with the last song here. And then also, let's see what else is here. Uh, looking at this, these are the Faith Promise Commitment Cards. And uh, many of those have come in. It is possible that maybe uh, you have not turned yours in yet, or maybe there's some that are out of town. And if you go, Pastor, I just forgot to do that, but I want to do that. And this, of course, is for our next year of missions. And what you do is you just put down amount. This is over and above tithes and offerings. You don't put your name on it. You just do that. You can throw it in the offering plate, uh, hand it to an usher, and you do that. Is there anybody going, I didn't get that. I have been so busy, I've been just spinning my wheels, just looking, looking here. Looks like everybody might have one. And I want you to pray about this, because my prayer for God, I, I don't want to hoard anything. I'm not uh, one of those, except I do have a box called keepsakes that my wife wants me to throw away. But other than that, um, I want you to know that we want to be a conduit for ministry. And the purpose of missions giving is to go through the church. It's not go to the church, we're going through. And so anyway, we're, we're about uh, $500 short of the goal. And so I want you to, anyway, just pray about it and uh, turn those in. It could be we have some out-of-towners that have forgotten as well, but we're just trying to plan as stewards of God's funds uh, for the new year. I'll, I'll tell you my heart. There's two church planners that I want to take on this year. My heart is very, very burdened for new churches, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. So be in prayer for that. And by the way, as you look in the bulletin, there are going to be other opportunities to give. One of the things we're going to be doing the entire month of April is we're going to be receiving offerings 
to the Clifton Cooley Fund. If you put Cooley Fund on there, it'll get to where it needs to go. And we're raising funds go into the Cooley Fund for the entire month of April. At the end of that April, every penny is going to a brand new church that has its official grand opening Sunday service on April 23rd in Redmond, Oregon. And every penny is going to help that brand new ministry that is grand opening. So why don't you know about that? And looking here, by the way, reminding you again, we now have weekly Bible studies at two facilities now, both Subtle Care and Mackay Creek. Also, let me talk about Faith Bible Institute, and that is registration is now open for new students. If you've never been a student of Faith Bible Institute, uh, you can talk to Brother Carl, you can talk to me and get answers for that. What a wonderful, wonderful opportunity this is and college-level Bible and theology, well-taught, and, uh, and I, there's college credits as well, and it's a three-year program, and it doesn't mean you have to take it all three years, but you'll be blessed if you even take one semester of it. And uh, so anyway, it's now open for new students, just opened up on April 1st, or returning students, where if you've taken at least a one-semester break, you can get back into it. And so letting you know about this, and you can ask Brother Carl about that. We, of course, have that Thursdays at 6.30. You can come, if you want, 6.30, for a preview night and just talk to Brother Carl about doing that. So just letting you know about those things. And then choir. Choir, we do have choir rehearsal this afternoon, 5 o'clock. And uh, be ready. We'll probably have a pickup rehearsal on Wednesday. We are going to be singing on Resurrection Sunday. What can I tell you about Resurrection Sunday? Early service next Sunday, 8.30, down in the fellowship hall. We have a fabulous time. We have a 30-minute early service. And we're praising the Lord about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then after that 30-minute service is over, we have the Berean breakfast. I know it's called the Berean brunch all the other time. This time it's the Berean breakfast. And um, anyway... Talk to Mrs. Watkins about um, what you might be able to bring. We, we had visions of grandeur. We're going to have that wonderful sign-up list out there. And uh, we both had uh, a collective memory lapse. We, uh, we uh, cooperated on that. And the sign-up list is not out. But we have a wonderful time. And uh, so we'll try to get word out to you and what we're looking for for that. Then teens and adults together at 10 o'clock, wonderful Resurrection Sunday service. Sunday night, um, I don't normally do this, it's film night. Next Sunday night, we're showing a film uh, called God Get Us to Romania. It is uh, the film in many ways. If, well, let me put it this way. If it's a documentary, it's one of the most humorous documentaries you've ever seen. But, um, but our missionary to Romania, he saw the humor in it when they were a young couple trying to get to Romania, and they made a fateful decision that created a colossal comedy of errors, and he has produced it and filmed it. And so anyway, the gospel is in it as well. It's going to be wonderful. And that'll be next Sunday night at 6 o'clock tonight. I will be speaking again on, you know, how is revival seen? What would it look like? And speaking on one more subject tonight uh, regarding that. And so looking at that here, we will have an outreach blitz this Saturday. Uh, we'll have a men's prayer and ladies prayer. But then at 10 o'clock, we're plastering the whole city with door hangers and inviting them to our Resurrection Sunday services. So we need all hands on deck for that. If you walk and you breathe, uh, have a temperature of 98.6 or higher, we'll take you. And uh, anyway, and uh, we're going to get the word out. We want to invite everybody that we can. And then we will have lunch will be provided at the end of that. As many of you know, the workday did not happen on time. We are, have moved that workday to April 29th is when we will have our church workday. So just uh, letting you know about that. Many other things I could tell you here. But I think that is enough for the time being. You can read the bulletin and, and hear about Somerville and the mother-daughter and, and many, many other things uh, that are going to be taking place. Uh, I want to stop now because I've been told it's a terrible death to be talked to death. So at this time, we're going to have the men come forward, an opportunity we have uh, to receive our Sunday morning offering. 
uh, not only our tithes and offerings, but our faith promise missions giving is how we support missions. Thank you for those who give to other funds as well, whether it be the Clifton J. Cooley or it be the vehicle fund that keeps our shuttles on the road and even our building fund. Uh, you folks have been so generous to the Lord and the Lord has used it and the Lord has helped us. Let's have a word of prayer, ask God's blessing on the offering. And so Mick, I'm going to ask if you would pray, but remember Danell as well to pray for her. put a plug in for this book it's worth every dime every dime great story this man went through a lot in Russia and uh, it's uh, a testimony to God's grace for every prayer that he answered for him let's stand and sing number 86 before the message heaven for me I'm ready <laughs> right now right now let's go It's 
seeing a person, seeing our Savior face to face, seeing the one who loved us, seeing the one who bought us. We're going to be turning in our Bibles this morning to John chapter 1. Remain standing if you can. If you cannot, remain comfortably seated. But looking at the book of John at chapter 1 this morning, uh, we have these uh, John and Romans we hand out very, very often. And when you're talking about um, the book of John, it's because uh, this gospel of John talks about how Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it talks about his Godhead. It talks about his deity. Uh, there is a reason that the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And it wasn't because they didn't like his doctrine. It's because they didn't like his person. They knew that he claimed to be the Son of God. They knew he claimed to be deity, and they were mad about it. Now, there's some false religions out there, and for some reason, they can't seem to figure out why they picked up rocks. And they try to come up with new fangled ideas. But it's important to understand, if Jesus was not God, there would be no way to heaven. And if his blood did not mean anything, there would be no way to heaven. The reality is we already know we can't work our way there. It's like trying to pay a nickel for a Cadillac. It doesn't make any sense even on paper. And the idea that somehow your good works can balance out your bad works, it doesn't work here on earth. You know, you help 10 old ladies across the street, you're still going to have to pay the full price for that speeding ticket you got. The judge isn't going to care what good things you did. He's going to make you pay. And the thing is, why do you think that somehow it's different in the heavenly realm and that God gives a pass for sin? He can't. He can't allow sin in heaven. You wouldn't want to go to heaven if there was sin in heaven. All of a sudden they go, hey, burglary's down 3% on the golden streets. Okay, and your chance of getting mugged by an angel is down just slightly as well. You wouldn't want to go. The reality is there could be no sin in heaven, so something must be done. We're talking in the teen class. Something must be done to pay for the sin of mankind. Look with me, John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And so you have the fact that there's somebody who has companionship with God the Father in the beginning, being called the Word of God. All things were made by Him, and go, well, who's the Him? It must be God. No, Him is the Word. Remember, it doesn't say in the beginning was God. It says in the beginning was the Word. For those of you who know English, the direct object points back to the Word. So all things were created by Him who is called the Word. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him, direct object pointing to the light, might believe. He, being John, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He, referring to the light, was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give me a supernatural clarity today as I communicate your word. The greatest tragedy that could possibly happen in your church here is somebody walk out the door and be yet unsaved and be dead in their sins with the price tag of sin still hanging over their head. I pray that you would do a difference 
and that you would do a work in our hearts today and that you would bring to life those things that are most needful and that your word would be considered preeminent. Please do a special work. Dear Holy Spirit, please work with power. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There have been many, many attempts to humanize the person of Jesus Christ, to literally create human guesswork on how he would humanly respond to certain situations. But I think it's very important to point out in the Word of God that the Word of God says clearly, the Lord seeth not as man seeth. And what that means is Jesus being God walking on this earth is not going to see things or react to things the same way that a mere man would act. Does it mean that Jesus wasn't human? Oh, yes, he was. The Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. He experienced what we did. He experienced tiredness. He experienced pain. But he wasn't just simply fully man. He's also fully God. And it wasn't 50-50, no mixture. It's called, they have a term for it, they call it the hypostatic union. And we have the fact that we have the man who's fully man and fully God. And being fully man, he limited some of his attributes. He took upon himself human flesh and at that particular point in time did not become omnipresent. But that did not mean that it was completely cut off or divorced from everything as well. And so... They assume, the people who have this idea of humanizing Jesus, they assume that Jesus would be encouraged by Palm Sunday, that would be encouraged by the triumphal entry, that he'd be encouraged by Hosanna, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. They would be mistaken. They assume that Jesus would be discouraged on the cross, and of course, that's how Hollywood depicts it. Hollywood depicts Jesus on the cross fighting for life with a vacant stare as life is taken from him. Nothing more could be farther from the truth when it comes from Jesus Christ. And they would be mistaken if they think he was discouraged on the cross. They would assume that Jesus would be ready to wipe the earth of all those who rejected him on that day. By the way, that was actually the attitude of some of his disciples. Some of his disciples, uh, they were going to a village, they were headed to Jerusalem. Well, the Samaritans didn't like the Jews, and so they wouldn't give them a motel room. They turned the no vacancy sign. And so the disciples had kind of this reaction. It says, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? And they thought that's how Jesus felt about those that rejected him. They would be mistaken. We're in John chapter 1. Let's relook at verses 10, 11, and 12 here. Because in 10, 11, and 12, we find the path of Jesus Christ from Palm Sunday to the cross. It says he was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We are going to take Christ's path this morning. And as we do so, we have no choice but to evaluate our own path when it comes to Almighty God. As we deal with this message that ends with, but as many as received him. Let's look at the three paths that Jesus took, starting with Palm Sunday. First of all, let's look at the path of lip service. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19. The book of Luke chapter 19 
And you'll find this is a great day and this is an exciting day, but it is only a lip service day. Luke 19, looking at verse 36. And it talks about, basically at this point, they have already got the colt, or they have already put their clothes on the colt, they've already set Jesus on the colt in their beginning, and you may be surprised by this, not the ascent into Jerusalem, but the descent into Jerusalem. For the entry doesn't start below, the entry starts at the Mount of Olives, descending into Jerusalem. And it says here, it says, verse 36, And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. So it wasn't just palm branches. They were taking off their coats and they were throwing them on the road. You know, it wasn't exactly a red carpet treatment, but let's say everybody was going to have to wash their clothes. But they were excited and they did throw down palm branches, as you know. And it says this, and when he was come nigh, it means when he was come near, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, Rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And everybody goes, oh, that's very symbolic. That's very allegorical. It's actually very factual. Remember that God created life and God created heaven. And sometimes we get this idea that we know what is alive and we don't know what is and we go well the rocks they're dead things not according to God if God can make rocks to shout they're not dead if the Bible says the heavens are telling the glory of God it means literally that heaven screams that God is real then things are not dead as you suppose or you appear you know it may not be life as you know it but it's still life and it's life as Jesus know it knows it who created the heavens and the earth but nevertheless, we have here and we're going, this is exciting. Jesus must be encouraged. He's not. Because point number one, this is the path of lip service. It's just lip service. And by the way, it's not hard for people to give lip service. I one time was singing in a choir in a community college and we were crashing and burning. But because the man directing the choir was some high nationally known choir director that was way, 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 way past his prime. They're all laughing and clapping like it's the greatest thing on planet Earth. And I'm looking down and I'm going, guys, you're just giving us lip service. Uh, this is a mess. This is not going well at all. And we know it. And you know what? Jesus knows how fickle and fair weather man can be. All you have to do is look back at Exodus chapter 15. And you look back, and this is, by the way, right after the crossing of the Red Sea, and all the people of Israel are going nuts, and they're laughing, and they're dancing, and they're saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. And they are having such a wonderful, wonderful time. And looking there in verse 21, it says, Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider have they thrown into the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Lip service is over, friends. Right after that, the whining started right away. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Murmuring means complaining. They went from praise to complaint. In fact, in just a few more days, they're going, We need to go back. Let's find somebody else to lead us. This is a mess. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's eat garlic. Let's eat onions. Let's eat leaks let's be slaves again i mean the whole nine yards just nuts 
And Jesus walking and seeing everybody praising his name, he goes, this is lip service. And it says, and he cried unto the Lord. I love the very beginning in verse 25. He cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And understand the importance and the significance of the tree. The tree is the type of the crucifixion. And the bitter waters is a type of the bitterness of man's soul. A man lost in sin and a man bondage of sin. But God showed Moses a tree. And here's the thing. And for all mankind and for all time, the wonderful thing is, is what does God do as he shows us a tree? And that tree is the cross of Jesus Christ. We're looking ahead even at a time like that. But Jesus knows how fickle and fair weather man can be. And how man can turn on a dime. And you can go from hero to zero in 20 seconds flat. Jesus knows that. And so here we are, and he's coming down the mount, and we've got to verse 40, but then we look at verse 41, and this is what Jesus saw when he saw Jerusalem. He did not see a throne room coming when he saw Jerusalem. In verse 41, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known even thou at least in this thy day the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from their eyes. And what's amazing is when he was on his way to Jerusalem, maybe only a day or two before he got to Jerusalem, he cried regarding Jerusalem at that time as well and said in Luke 13, um, looking at uh, just a second, let me get this right here. Luke 13, 34, and he says, O oh, Jerusalem! Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets, and stoneth them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Everybody else saw a party. The king is coming. Jesus saw what was coming next, which was going to be a full and wholesale rejection of the Savior. Here's our reality. Do we only serve him if he serves us? Is that our reality? Is that the fair weatheredness of our lives? The Bible says this in Luke chapter 7, looking at verse 31. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. What is your reaction to Almighty God when you ask Him to do something and He doesn't do what you want? What happens in the giant spiritual gumball machine in the sky if you turn the crank and the gumball doesn't come out? Jesus, when he walked the path, that entry into Jerusalem with the clothes and the palm branches and the shouting, Jesus knew, being God, he knew it was the path of lip service. But secondly, Jesus knew the path of rejection. And this is a very, very hard thing. And sometimes people think, well, Jesus got to Jerusalem and somehow he would be later surprised with the rejection. He wasn't surprised. He knew that before. You look in John chapter 6, verse 66. It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. What had happened in John chapter 6 is Jesus had preached a hard sermon. And he had an altar call and the back door opened and the stampede, they all went out the door. And he's there looking at his own disciples and he's saying, will ye also go away? And they did it. But they would. In the book of Matthew, chapter 26, you're looking at the very, very end and it's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and uh, they have taken him and we'll see what his good and strong disciples did. You get to the end of Matthew 26, 56. And the very last phrase is, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. This is the path of rejection. 
But not only the path of rejection, it was a rejection of the masses. And you remember all these people are saying he's the king of kings and lord of lords and they're praising him. But you get to Matthew 27 and you look in verse 20. And it says, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. They persuaded them, by the way, successfully so, mission accomplished. The governor answered and said unto them, Whither of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Christ being the anointed one. They all say unto him, did you catch the word all? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? Even the governor, Pilate himself, could not find a law that Jesus had broken. But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people, what an amazing prophetic statement. His blood be on us and our children. What an amazing future tense statement. And at that point they're saying we will be ultimately responsible. And yet the amazing thing is through the blood of Christ, they also will have the opportunity at another time to be ultimately blessed. What an amazing thing. He's rejected by his disciples. He was rejected by the masses. But he was also rejected by the promise breakers. The ones who had promised him that they would be through and through, true and true. And in Luke chapter 22, looking at verse 54. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house and Peter followed afar off. You know you're in trouble when the person who promised you everything is following afar off. You no, know, every pastor of a church knows he's in trouble if the people go, Pastor, we're behind you. Way behind you. You know you're in trouble. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire. It means she stared at him. And earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour, another confidently affirmed, saying, of a truth, this fellow was also with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what you sayest. And immediately while he spake, the cock crew, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. You often wonder what was in the eyes of Jesus when he looked on Peter. It doesn't tell us. Was it vindictiveness? Was it sadness? We don't know. Or was it, I told you so. I told you to deny me. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. And so, remember what we talked about. We talked about the path of lip service, that Jesus would be encouraged, but he wasn't. And we said, well, now he's going to the cross. He will be discouraged. No, he was not. And the Bible says this in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, looking at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the same, and is set down at the right hand of God. When Jesus came to the cross, he didn't look to the cross, he looked through the cross. 
And what was he seeing when he looked through the cross? He was seeing victory through the cross. And when he yelled, when the sky had already turned black because of all the sins of all mankind of all time, coalesced like a lens into one spot in one moment in time, as all the sins of all mankind were put on him, he said, it is finished. But in the Greek, it wasn't a word of defeat, it's a word of victory. It was the same thing that Roman soldiers said when they had finished the marathon and that they said it is finished. It meant victory time, folks. He looked through the cross. So we're two-thirds of the way through the path. The path of lip service. And the path of rejection. So this brings us where we must review again. Again, looking at John chapter 1 and looking at verses 10 through 12. Where the Bible says, And he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. They'd give him lip service, but they didn't really know who Jesus was. They didn't really know who God was. He came unto his own, as his own received him not. They rejected him, and they nailed him to the cross. The fickle people who wanted God in their own image, the people who rejected Christ, and this brings us to this question. What will Jesus do to those now living who have rejected him? Understand, we, we've gone through the path of rejection. And then it says, but as many as received him. What an amazing statement. They've all rejected him. And then what happens? And this is where you learn something about God. And this is where we learn something about our own path in life. But as many as received him. Pastor, are you saying the people who rejected him were given another chance? That is exactly what I'm saying. Because the character of God never changes. What does the Bible say in 2 Peter 3, 9? He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you're saying God would give somebody another chance who's rejected him? Well, let's let the scriptures talk here. Look at Acts chapter 2. The book of Acts chapter 2, and Peter is preaching a message. He is the most equipped to preach the message, but because he's the most equipped to understand the message, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Acts chapter 2, looking at verse 36, as Peter's preaching to these people, and he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus and by the way, ye in the King James is always y'all. Means everybody, y'all, y'all. And he says, whom ye have crucified. I picture Peter, I mean, let's face it. I mean, he looks to me like the type of guy who would talk with his hands. And he said, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. What is Peter doing here? And it says, when they heard this, they were pricked to their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children." And to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from the sun toward generation. Then they that gladly received his words were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. What can I tell you about these 3,000 souls? I can tell you that they were the salvation of 3,000 fair weather who became rejectors. Because what did Peter say? Whom ye crucified. He said, you did it. You're the same crowd that was yelling, crucify him, crucify him. You were the fair weather ones who were on the hill and you were saying, Hosanna 
to the Lord. And then you were the one saying, crucify him, crucify him. He says, yep, God even will let you in. This tells you something about Almighty God. Peter preached the second chance to the masses. Why would Peter preach this? Because Peter knew everything about being given a second chance. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as we speak about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas. Who's that? That's Peter. Why did Jesus show up and appear to Peter, that wretched man who denied that he even knew Jesus Christ? Second chances, folks. He's the God of the second chance. He's the God where people have rejected him. And people do reject him. And he is still the God of the second chance. Peter was given a second chance. How many chances will God give you? Who has the answer to that? Here it is again. Peter's the one who has the answer. Back maybe a year before in Matthew chapter 18. Peter, who really wasn't feeling terribly forgiving that day, asked Jesus on the subject of forgiveness. Peter was hoping, he's looking for the divine loophole for forgiving somebody. Seems to be one of the biggest problems even God's people has. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then came Peter unto him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith to him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. We're doing a lot of math right here, and I'm sorry, most of us can't keep track on our palm pilot whether we've forgiven somebody 490 times. How many chances will God give you? He'll give you a chance. He'll give you a chance. And he'll give you a chance. And maybe you'll reject him again. Maybe you'll fail him again. Maybe you'll betray him again. Maybe you'll deny him again. And he'll give you a chance. He'll give you a chance. He'll give you a chance. Until the day. What is the day? It is appointed for man once to die and after this, the judgment. Once that day happens, there are no more chances. But it's plain to see the path that Jesus took. He took the path of lip service. God can name the name of every single false worshiper who's worshipped him in falsehood even if it ever happens in this room. He can name the lip service. And so sometimes God is not nearly so impressed as we are about praise. Secondly, he knows rejection. He's experienced it before. He experienced it then. What's amazing is rejection did not, did not discourage him from the cross. It probably was meant to. But he looked through the cross. What did he see on the other side of the cross? He saw you. And he saw me. And he saw himself currently seated at the right hand of God. So what does he do now? He preaches through his word. And just preach to all those people who were indeed personally responsible for crucifying him. He preached another chance. At that moment, at that day, there are 3,000 people who took him up on that chance. We have all failed God at one time or another. But just as Jesus never diverted from his path, he has left a path for us. 
Jesus declared the path. Jesus said, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said, I am the path. And Jesus said, not only am I at the path, what's at the end of the path? I'm at the end of the path. And he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then the one, the third step in the path, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Do you need a chance today? God will give you one. Let's have a word of prayer. We will have a word of prayer and extend an invitation. An invitation is an opportunity. The opportunity is before a mighty God who created you, who has loved his creation, who must, he must punish sin. He cannot allow it into heaven. But he gives you a chance. And another. And another. Because that's who he is. There will come a day where we'll run out of chances. But if you're not saved this morning, he wants to give you another chance. It's his purpose on the cross. He loves you. And he wants to help you. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that as we look at your word and we look at the truth of your word, that, Lord, if we ever do fail you, I pray that we would come back because you will take us back. And also, Lord, if we've, there's someone here who's never received your Son as their personal Savior and therefore they do not have eternal salvation, that this would be the day of decision, whether that person be somebody in our building or that be a person who for some reason is viewing live stream. Please bring them to yourself, we pray. And as we stand together, the song is 167. Because the reality is, is sometimes we try to straighten our tie and straighten our shirt and tuck our britches. Try to somehow make ourselves good enough for God and it's time to stop trying that. And understand that God will take us as is. He loves you, and he wants you to come to him. And so this is that opportunity, whether it's coming to him, whether it's coming back to him, whether it's recommitting to him. You come while we sing this song. Uh -huh.